summer is officially here. States are reopening, new coronavirus cases are declining, not locally, but in many parts of the United States, they're at least holding steady. Over 100 scientific teams around the world are racing to develop a vaccine, and that's about it for the good news as far as the pandemic goes. The virus has shown no sign of going away. We will be in this pandemic era for the long haul, likely a year or more. The masks, the social distancing, the fretful hand washing, that aching withdrawal from friends and family. Those are the best steps we can take to stay well and to keep each other well. And most of us will be doing those things for some time to come. And God knows, coronavirus is just one of the many communal struggles at the forefront. This past week, I saw online several different communal rituals, observations in different faith traditions to express lament, to acknowledge pain. We need those rituals. People have always needed to express communal grief. Our Hebrew ancestors wrote psalms of communal lament following natural disasters or plagues or major oppression from surrounding nations. They wrote songs to express their suffering and to sort of brace them for the long journey ahead. Our ancient reading today is Psalm 90, a psalm of lament. The psalms, for the most part, assume that God sent the difficulty, or at least allowed it, while I'm not so sure about that, we can listen to the Psalms and we can resonate with that feeling of how long, O oh Lord. So first we will hear Mike Bass reading Psalm 90, then we'll hear a modern lesson. The ancient reading this week comes from Psalm 90. I bet you to listen as I read. A Psalm of Lament. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight, or like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like the grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger, by your wrath we are overwhelmed, you set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days pass away under your wrath. Our years come to an end like a sigh. The days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80 if we are strong. Even then their span is only toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to our servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. 
O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Thank you to Elizabeth for recording that song for us from her own backyard, no less. It's really good to hear your voice and to see you in worship. You might remember a couple of years back, Elizabeth and I did a worship service together here in this sanctuary focused on mental health. She is quite open about what it's like for her to live with anxiety and depression as she shared that day in worship, she feels that you know, speaking openly about mental illness is one of the ways that we begin to lessen the stigma that is sometimes attached to it. I asked her to sing that particular song, My Backyard, first of all, because I like it. I think it's a great song. But also because she shared with us that day in worship that she wrote that song during a time when her agoraphobia was strong and she found herself unable, literally unable to leave her home. So think about those words. If this ain't the sh longest, shortest trip around the world in my backyard, looking for the crazy peacefulness, you wouldn't think it'd be so hard. But it was and it is. It was worth every mile. When I come through here, you're going to see me smile. I find it very powerful the way Elizabeth managed to take this challenge, a very difficult struggle that confined her to her house. Sound familiar? And she was able to transform that into something beautiful. Most of us now know the struggle of being isolated in our homes, or at least having our activities reduced somewhat. We're trying to figure out how to find that crazy peacefulness. You wouldn't think it would be so hard. Elizabeth is a gifted singer, songwriter, in addition to being just a lovely human being. If you're not familiar with her music, uh, please check her out. I think her website is on the screen right now. Somebody like Elizabeth Wills can channel her struggle into song into incredible songs. It's a rare gift. Not many of us can do that. We're not songwriters. We're not talented in that way. 
We're talented in different ways. Some find other creative ways to find healing and hope through music. I reached out to one of those people over Zoom a couple of days ago. Okay, Liza, in normal times, I would have asked you to come to worship so that everybody could meet you in person. For now, Zoom is the closest thing we have to that. And as we've discussed, I do plan to show the video in worship on Sunday. So let me introduce you to everybody. Everybody, this is Liza Hawkins. Liza just graduated from Bright Divinity School with an MDiv, right? You're an MDiv mm -hmm. person. Yes. Yep. Uh, congratulations on that. It must have been very strange not to be able to walk or have observation. Um, Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Eliza is preparing for ordination in the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And we met a few months ago when I co-taught a class at the Divinity School that you were in. So, um, in one of the class presentations that you made, you mentioned a spiritual practice that's meaningful to you. You make playlists that sort of speak to the seasons of your life. Can you just tell folks a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it actually, it's a project that I started a few years ago with my birthday, actually. I would make a playlist for my birthday and I would put one song on the playlist for every year of my life and um, I would it would just be a time for me to reflect on the past year and and see what it has brought me and what I have hope for the next year and add different songs and so I'm working on my I'm about to turn 28 actually and I'm working on my 28 songs for July um, and it's so you do this my ev you do this every birthday mm -hmm. yep uh -huh. and my birthday ones I usually I will have it going for the year and then I scrap it and do the next one. Um, so I've got my 27 one that I've been listening to and I'm getting ready to scrap it and start the new one. Um, but my favorite song, one of my favorite songs is Seasons of Love from Jonathan Larson's Rent. Yes. And that's the song that really kind of what served as the inspiration for this practice. How do you measure a year and thinking about um, thinking about what the year has brought and what the the years to come will bring. My family has birthday traditions that are questions for reflection. Um, and so I transferred that practice to other areas of my life. Um, seasons of the year was a big one, church seasons. Um, but even just kind of moods that I have, thinking of like maybe a more melancholy playlist or a celebratory playlist. I made a playlist for my brother's wedding a couple of years ago, that kind of marking certain certain seasons and certain events in mine and my family's life. That is so, that is so cool. I have to tell you, um, I really perked up when you said that in class and uh, you'll remember I was like, can you please share some playlists <laughs> with me? And I have listened to, you've, you've shared maybe four different playlists. I've listened to them and really just listening to them. They're so carefully um, put together uh, it's it's been very meaningful to me i i thank you for that i was riding my bike and listening to one the other day and uh from hamilton it's quiet uptown mm -hmm. came on and it just struck me as this incredible to apply that idea it's quiet uptown to where we are now and uh so it's just it's really cool but let me ask you you use the word or the term spiritual practice mm -hmm. How is it a spiritual practice to you as opposed to just listening to great music? Or is there sure. a difference? Um, I, there is. And I grew up in a very musical family. We have music going all the time. And all of us, all of us listen to music all the time. Um, and it, if I'm thinking of the correct playlist that has It's Quiet Uptown, that is a playlist that I made. That's a grief playlist I made shortly after mm -hmm. a friend died of a sudden cardiac event. Um, and that playlist sprung out of those emotions, but it's a spiritual practice for me because I think it works the way that I think all spiritual practices really do. Uh, they take something that is kind of every day and all around us and it funnels it in with an intentional lens, breathing, walking, listening to music, mm -hmm. doing anything, anything that we do normally with an intentional spiritual lens, I think is a spiritual practice. 
Oh, that's, that's really, really beautiful. Um, I thank you for, for doing it and for sharing it with us. Uh, one last question. Do you have a, a song that's speaking to you now? I know you, you just moved back home. You just moved from Fort Worth to Tennessee. Um, but it, it's a, a, certainly a time of transition in your life and this craziness we're all living in. Is there a song speaks to you, that speaks to you now? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot because, you know, I've gone through several transitions. We're in a certain um, global climate right now. Um, and it was hard to pick one thing, but I've, I've been <laughs> trying to think of a playlist about kind of the, the current cultural moment that we're living in. And a song that I've been listening to on repeat is a song called American Pie by uh, the artist Shay Diamond. Uh -huh. And Shay Diamond is a black trans uh, woman who sings very political messages, but um, this one has kind of been on repeat. The refrain is just, I just want my piece of the American pie. You got your slice, now I just want mine. Um, oh. And so I've been listening to that, especially this week. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll, I'll check it out. I was thinking the other American pie, of course. But. Right. <laughs> <laughs> slightly different from Donald Yeah, King. slightly different from that. Um, Thank you a lot. I'll let you go get back to your projects that you're working on. I really appreciate you taking a few minutes for us and Absolutely. all the best to you as you Absolutely. prepare to be a priest. That's the goal. Okay. <laughs> Take care, honey. Bye. Thanks, Leanne. Bye. Music is spiritual practice. It can be enormously helpful for our mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Some of us write songs or psalms. Some mindfully assemble the works of others into meaningful collections. And some of us find great comfort simply in singing, especially singing together. And we miss it. You don't have to be a professional or even have a strong voice to find comfort and strength in singing together. Not only does online worship mean that we cannot hug, but we can't sing together. It's probably one of the things that we miss most about being together in church. And the really, really hard news is that singing together will also be among the last activities that we'll be able to resume. When we gradually return to face-to-face -face worship, whatever that's going to look like, we will still not be able to sing together. There simply is no way to safely sing in a group because of the amount of aerosols that are generated by singing and the droplets that go out into the air. There are numerous documented cases. You likely have seen them about choirs rehearsing where a single member later is confirmed with COVID. You know, they showed no symptoms at the rehearsal. Days later, dozens of members of the choir are infected, and in many cases, some of them fatally. That means that neither choirs nor congregations will be able to resume singing together for the foreseeable future, at least until there is a vaccine and effective treatment for coronavirus. And I have to tell you, I personally find that crushing. I know many of you do too. And I really hate to add that to the pile of lament that we have to wade through. But it's a reality of church. It's a reality that we need to start facing the sooner the better. Acknowledgement and acceptance of difficult realities is a most important step to working your way through them. So we start by willingness to be present to what is rather than trying to change it. German poet Bertolt Brecht wrote, In the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. 
We may not be able to sing together again for a long time. Even when we begin to worship together. But there will still be singing. And we will one day sing together again. Until we do that, it is up to us to get creative and find new ways to draw strength from song. Ways to keep looking for that crazy peacefulness. We'll go to the backyard and sing by ourselves. We'll make virtual choirs. We'll learn to play the piano or the guitar. Better yet, learn to play the uke. We'll sing with our housemates. We'll listen deeply to music of choirs and congregations singing. Mostly, we'll trust the universe and dream of the day that we can lift our voices in song together again or hear others lift their voices. We'll find safe ways to keep on singing through these dark times. Will there be singing in the dark times to come? A brash and bridled evil cloud, our wits and strike us dumb. Will there be rhythms and harmonies and rhymes? Will there be songs? Will we be singing?
there will be songs and we'll be singing in the dark times. There's one more thing that we're going to do to keep song alive. We're going to make a playlist. That's right. I mean, really, our church is going to put a list of songs together that bring us happiness. So tomorrow, look on the church Facebook page. There's going to be a post, I know these things, inviting each and every person, young and old and in between, member, friend, or stranger, to submit the name of one song that brings them happiness or peace. It doesn't have to be a recording of it, just the name of the song. Don't make this harder than it is. It does not have to be your most favorite song ever. It doesn't have to be religious, though it can be. It doesn't have to be sophisticated or intellectual. Just one song that when you hear it or sing it, it makes you happy. One song that is speaking to you right now. Got it? That's your homework. We'll also be getting the word out on to, for people who are not on Facebook. So you can email me the name of your song or message the church office. I'm very interested in hearing what we come up with as a community. I hope to see you next week for worship. Until then, one day at a time, friends one step at a time, one song at a time, and we'll get through this together. I invite you to join me in our closing benediction that's on your screen. It's written by social justice activist L.R. Nost. Read along with me. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can be mended, not with time, as they say, but with intention. So go, love unconditionally, I'm sorry, love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is you. Friends, go out and share the light that is you. Go in peace.